Amen. Thank you, choir. Well, I guess good to see you again this morning. No, on my part, it's good to see you again. I know you wish your pastor was here. Uh, and I'm, I just want to say I'm so thankful for uh, the actions of the church in, um, in looking after your pastor as he's looking out after his family. I, I want to say, uh, on behalf of, the, of Oklahoma Baptist as our state convention, we want to do everything that we can to help you. Uh, as, as, you, as you move through this. But I want to say personally that um, uh, I, I, I've already told Barry, I've told uh, Kurt and others, and, and certainly James, that uh, if there's anything that I can do, anything that our state convention can do as, as you all are walking with your pastor through that, we are here to support you. And that's, that's an important distinction about our state convention. Our new executive director has said it again and again. Uh, there was a period of time where the state convention was out front and leading the churches, and that is not the way it's supposed to be. The churches are supposed to be out front, and the state convention is here to help you and to resource you as, uh, as we continue to... Um, to do the work of the Great Commission together. And so I, I just want to convey that message to you. I'm thankful for you as a church and, and, and what you are doing. I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles this morning to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. And if you would, please stand with me as we'll begin reading, actually, in John chapter 7, verse 53. In most of your Bibles, you will see a little, uh, a little footnote, a little parenthetical reference that's just above that that says the earliest manuscripts do not include this passage. And we're going to talk about that just a little bit. Beginning in John chapter 7, verse 53. They went each to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. And all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law of Moses, uh, now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? This they said to test him that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away, one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go. And from now on, sin no more. This is the reading of God's holy word. Father, thank you for the truth that we see in this passage. May we all recognize today that it is not by the law that we are made right with a holy God. But it is the law that leads us to grace. The unfathomable riches of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Today as I preach your word, I pray that it would be Jesus that is seen for what all of us need, regardless of the issues that we face this day 
is to see Jesus. Let us see you before us today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Introductions to sermons are meant to grab people's attention. So I want to grab your attention this morning as I give you this introduction. Because as I just said, and I'll say it again, introductions are intended to grab people's attention. The story that we just read, you need to know that most biblical scholars, conservative Bible-believing, biblical scholars do not believe that this story, the woman caught in adultery, should be considered a part of the inspired text of the Gospel of John. Do I have your attention? <laughs> they would say that it's, uh, it, it should not be considered a part of the Scriptures here in the Gospel of John. Now, I realize that that's, uh, that's a dangerous thing to mention. Among Oklahoma Baptists, uh, it's, uh, it's always a risky call to, to bring into question a fan favorite. And for many of you, this story is a fan favorite. It's frequently quoted over and over again. Matter of fact, just like the, the passage that I shared with you last week about, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free, um, even people on CNN will quote that. Well, I, I, maybe I... <laughs> Let me give you another one that they will quote. Let me give you another one that, that uh, people of... of um, I, just, I better not get myself in trouble today. <laughs> All kinds of people will quote. Newspapers will quote it. N uh, news people will quote it. People from the White House will quote it. He who is without sin cast the first stone, right? I mean, all kinds of people will throw that out there. But before you get too ruffled about these Bible scholars who are who are saying this, I, I want you to understand something. They're not saying that this story is not true, that it didn't happen. It gives several indications that it is an authentic Jesus story. In other words, what I mean by that is as you read that story about the woman that's caught in adultery, it, that just sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? It just sounds exactly like what Jesus would do. The principle of the story, the big idea, is foundational, and it is found as the very heart of the Bible. When Jesus is, has this woman who's been caught in what most would consider a, a heinous sin, she's standing right before him, obviously she's weeping, and Jesus stands and says to her, neither do I condemn you. That's the heart of the Bible. It's what we understand to be about Jesus. Yet, I want to I say to you today, there are a few good reasons to possibly see this story as having not been original to John. So, I, I'm going to do something today, and I can tell by some of the looks on your face, like, oh, this is going to be interesting. I'm going to do something today that, uh, that would probably be suggested to a first-year preaching student that they should not do. But I'll also say this is not my first year. And that is, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you kind of two different big ideas here. Because we're at a text that's unique in the Gospel of John. And it would be almost criminal for us to move past it and not give some explanation to this. So with all that said, I want, I want you to see why, I want you to see why today 
as you look in your Bible, and, and for most of you, if you have an English Standard Version or a New American Standard Bible or an NIV Bible, you look there and you see that parenthetical reference that says the earliest manuscripts do not include chapter 7, verse 53 through chapter 8, verse 11. How many of you, that's you? This is audience participation here. Okay, that's you. If your neighbor next to you doesn't see that in their Bible, would you show them your Bible? Okay. There's some good reasons why that's there, and for many of you, you've never known why it's, why it's there. And you go, why, why, is it not, why is it not in some Bibles? Today, I want you to see why you can have utter, complete confidence in your Bible. Even when it has uh, something like this in it where it says the earliest manuscripts do not include this. If you look at the very end of Matthew, ch uh, Mark chapter 16, the end of the resurrection story, you see the same thing. There is a parenthetical reference at the end of it that says this is not included in most manuscripts. And some of you have wondered forever, why, why is that? Why, why is that there? So that's the first thing I'm going to do this morning is I want to explain to you why that's there and why you can have complete, utter confidence in the Bible that you have in your hands. And then secondly, we're going to dig out of this story its primary principle and see that it is established throughout the Bible because it strikes at the very heart of what it means to be a Christian. So, you're going to have to listen a little bit faster than you are now, because I'm going to speed up, and we've got to get on with this. First of all, if you're taking, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. L let's look, first of all, at the accuracy of the text. Let's look at the accuracy of the text, because there are a few reasons why this story is questioned, and why there's this parenthetical reference that's there. The first reason is that because the, this passage from 753 through 811, there are certain vocabulary words that are used there that are in all 12 verses, in every single one of those 12 verses, that are not found anywhere else in the rest of the gospel of John. Interesting. For instance, in, in verse 3, it uses the word scribes. It says, the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and placing her in the midst, they said to him, and then it goes on. The, the word scribes is not used anywhere else in the Gospel of John. He talks about Sadducees and Pharisees all the time, but he never brings up the scribes. And here, it's used. So the vocabulary is very different. So it would be, it would be something like this, if you would. If you're looking at social media... And, and you see that a friend has said something. In so I can tell right now this illustration is not hitting strong with a lot of you. If you're looking at social media and you're reading something that a friend has said and you go, that doesn't sound like something that my friend would say. You know? So like if, you, if I was on social media and all of my friends are looking at my stuff and I, and I say something like, I can't wait to watch the OSU Cowboys play this weekend... Well, you all know that's not me. Still not hitting, right? It would be uncharacteristic, but then all of a sudden what you see is that I'm quoting one of my good friends. You see, that's, that's what's happening here. That's what it looks like is happening here. The, the vocabulary just doesn't match up with the rest of what we've seen. Now, the second thing that we see here is, is the placement of where it is in the Gospel of John. In, in the earliest of Bibles, we don't have this passage is not in them at all. Now, in some manuscripts, in John chapter, uh, John chapter uh, the end of John chapter 7 and through verse 8, some of them are at the very end of John. At the very end of John, some of them, uh, this passage is not included at all in the Gospel of John, but it is included in the Gospel of Luke. It's interesting. So the placement is different in some Bibles. And then there's this whole thing about that parenthetical reference. Uh, in fact, I want you just to turn back over to Mark for just a minute. 
And, and you'll see the other one that I was talking about, Mark chapter 16. Some of you may be asking, why in the world is he doing this today? Why, does this, why are we doing this and it feels like a seminary class or a Bible college class? He, he, I want you to stay with me on this. This is why. Because I want you to have complete confidence in the Bible that you have. That the Bible that sits in your lap is, is thus saith the Lord. It's authoritative. And, it, and you can have complete confidence in it. Look, Mark 16, and, and look there between verse 8 and verse 9. It says the same thing, right? Some of the earliest manuscripts do not include chapter 16, 9 through 20. And, and the reason why in the Gospel of Mark is the same reason that we see in the Gospel of John. Because the words that are used are absolutely, completely different. In, in fact, it's not just the words, it's the way that the words are used. It's the semantics. It's, it's everything. It's the, uh, the structures of the sentences are vastly different than are used in the rest of the Gospel of Mark. I mean, in the, in the Gospel of Mark, in the end of this passage, it even says, you know, it talks about handling snakes and drinking poison. And that just doesn't sound like what Mark has been talking about. So, uh, what about all this manuscript stuff that I'm talking about? It says the earliest manuscripts do not include this. It says it there in between John 7 and John 8. It says it again in Mark 16. What, what about all this manuscript business? I, I want you to understand something this morning. The Bible that you hold in your hand, we don't have the original documents. We don't have what Paul wrote on. We don't have what Mark or John or Matthew, we, we don't have the actual original documents that they wrote on. They're lost. They're, they're gone. So how do we know what they said? Well, what happened was that as those passages, as those letters and the gospels were being passed around to different churches, there were people who were very careful, very meticulous to write those things down and to copy them meticulously. And so there would be copies and copies of copies and copies of copies of copies and on and on and on, and there would be hundreds of these that were being passed around through different churches and to different groups of Christians so that they could read the gospel, so they could read what Paul was saying to Ephesus, so they could read what Peter had written, written to the Christians in Rome. And so we have these mounds and mounds of manuscripts. So we don't have the originals that Paul, Mark, and all they wrote with, but what we do have is a number of manuscripts that we can match against one another, and the more that they corroborate with one another, the more that they say the same things, the more that we can tell what was written in the original. Does that make sense? N nudge the person next to you, wake them up. So what is being said by these scholars is that these two, uh, these two stories, and particularly this one about the woman caught in adultery, it's not found in the earliest ones. Earliest meaning closest in date to what we believe was written by, uh, the, by John, the one who wrote this gospel. Not found in those earliest manuscripts that we have. It's found in some other places, and it sounds a whole lot like Jesus. But I want you to hear this again this morning. Thousands and thousands of manuscripts. And they're used to compare against one another for accuracy. Now, I want you to just put that in comparison. The best historical works that, that um, ancient literary scholars point to, like Homer's Iliad. Who all had to read Homer's Iliad in high school or college? Now wake that person up, right? Or writings by Alexander the Great, or writings about Julius Caesar. I want you to hear me this morning. The number of manuscripts, we don't have any of those originals either. 
Nobody has what Homer wrote on. Nobody has what Alexander wrote. Uh, Not the originals or Julius Caesar and the Gaelic Wars. We don't have the original copies, but what we have are copies of copies of copies. But the number of manuscripts that we have for those works that nobody questions whether or not those were authentic or not do not even pale in comparison to the number of manuscripts that we have of the New Testament. It's fascinating. Doesn't even come close. So just take, for instance, Homer's Iliad. We have about 50, 50, 50 manuscripts. So they're able to compare those against one another, and they have the best writing, which they can see this is probably what Homer actually wrote. The New Testament does not have 50. The New Testament has 25,000 manuscripts. We have today 25,000 manuscripts. Now, they're not all complete. They're, some of them are parts, but we have A multitude, a pile, a load, whatever you want to call it. We got a we got a truck full of manuscripts that show us exactly what was written when we compare them against one another. The more manuscripts, it's likely to have some differences, yes. Anybody ever written an I, a cursive I that looks like an E? Does Do you all know what cursive is? Okay. Just make sure. (laughs) Yeah, sometimes there are some differences. The more that is written, the more manuscripts that we have, there are a few little differences, but it's differences like that. It looked like an I, and it should have been an E. But a closer, it gives us a closer view as to what is What likely was the originals, it gives us what we call corroboration. Another key factor is the earlier manuscripts, the closer in date to the originals. So, for instance, the Gaelic Wars by Caesar, or Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey, those are some of the best attested Uh, No one doubts them. All of them have copied manuscripts. Now watch this that are more than a thousand years older than what we know the original was written. More than a thousand years. So there were copies that were written all along uh, after each cent- during each century, but the earliest we-, we have, the closest that we have to it, is a thousand years old. Listen, did you know that recently we found a manuscript of the Gospel of John, a a piece of the Gospel of John that we believe is within 30 years. We just found it. That's incredible. The, The closer that we have the manuscript in date, the more accurate it will be. It's like if I say to you, if I say to somebody over here, hey, Repeat this sentence to the next four people verbally, and then the next eight people write down what those next four people wrote. And if I say to you, my big old dog just just scared your tiny little scrawny cat, get it word for word. And then you repeat it to the next person, they repeat it to the next person, they repeat it to the next person, they repeat it to the next person. Now the next person is supposed to write that down, so they write it down, they show it to somebody, then they bring it back and they write it down, show it to somebody and bring it back. What do you think it's going to be by the time that we get over here? My dog ate your cat. Right? Because the further it gets away, the more likely it is that we have problems, right? You see that what I'm talking about with manuscripts? We have these early manuscripts. Listen, I am Southern Baptist to the core, but the fact that we have something that close to the original writings makes me want to dance. That's incredible. So what are you saying, Andy, about all this? Why why does this feel like such a seminary class today? Here's what I want you to know. When I see this, when it says the earliest manuscripts don't include this, I don't think, wow, is this real or is it not? What I think is I can trust my Bible. 
I can believe my Bible because they're meticulous. Even if it sounds like a story that is exactly like Jesus. And by the way, this sounds exactly like Jesus. I'm going to preach it. I'm still in the, in the introduction right now. <laughs> but here's what I want you to know, and especially you young people, I want you to understand and know this. Because you're going to be told again and again and again, oh, you can't trust the Bible. There are problems in the Bible. There are issues in the Bible. There are mistakes in the Bible. There are, there are places that contradict one in places with each other in the Bible. Here's what I want you to know. As we look at all of the earliest manuscripts in the, in the original languages, here's what you can know. There has never been an, a work of literary, uh, of ancient literature that is as reliable as the Bible that you hold in your hand. It's reliable. It's true. Don't, not four or five of you. If it's everybody, it's fine. Listen, you can trust the Bible. You can trust it not just for inspiration. You can trust it for historical accuracy. You can, you can trust it when, when it starts to pile up against science. You can trust the Bible. Now, we, we've got to learn how to read. Our problem is not trying. Our problem is we've got to read it. Right? All right, so let's read it. So after all of that, Andy, why is this story that's not found in those manuscripts, why is, why is it still in your text there? Because it appears true, it's consistent with Jesus, and it is the point of the Bible. So let's look at it. Let's just look at the story. First of all, so I told you about the accuracy of the text. Now I want you to look at the attempt to trap. This is an attempt to trap Jesus. Look what he does. Look what happens here. Let's read verse 1 again. Jesus had gone to the Mount of Olives, and early the next morning he came again to the temple. Uh, this is during one of the feasts. Jesus, this was his practice. He would go down to the temple and he would teach. And all the people came to him, and he sat down and he taught them. You see, we got it backwards. I stand up, you sit down. Right? Then it was everybody else stand up, and Jesus sat down. That's why he taught for a long, 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 long time. You'll get it. And it says, The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. They brought her into the temple, and, and they placed her in the midst, and they said to him, by the way, the word placing her means that they threw her down. Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. That, that's what the Pharisees are trying to do here. They're just trying to catch Jesus so that, because they hate him. They are attempting to trap Jesus. He comes from the Mount of Olives. He's teaching in the temple. This huge crowd gathers around, and right in the middle of Jesus' teaching, he's in the middle of his sentence, they walk up, and a, an embarrassing scene just explodes right there. Awkwardly, these conniving, conspiring, lying leaders angrily flail this woman down to the ground. This woman, who moments before had been caught in the very act of adultery, now she is crumpled up, disheveled, ashamed. She's a crying heap, and, and she's in front of everybody for everybody to see. She's embarrassed. There's other people that are embarrassed for her. And there is a lot of indignation. This would, if you can get this picture in your head, this woman has got to be what we would call ugly crying. Some, you all know what I'm talking about. Ugly crying. She's got to be at that point, manhandled into place. And these agenda-wielding clergymen have abruptly interrupted Jesus' teaching in order to ask the question, or more accurately, to make an accusation. And the accusation that they make is that she's been caught in adultery, the law says that she should be stoned, so what are you going to do about that, Jesus? What do you say? 
Their invasion into this worship service really served two purposes. The first was for them to appear like they're concerned about the law. They're, they're, they're very concerned about spiritual things. Okay? About God's standards. They want to make it known to everyone that that's a big priority for them. But really, secondly, is they want to put Jesus in a corner. They want to get him stuck. So they, they appeal to the law. This is what the law says, Jesus, that she should be killed. I want you to understand something. For Jews, the law is definitive. There is no wiggle room whatsoever. In fact, I'm going to ask you to turn your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 20. Keep your finger back there in, in John chapter 8, but look at Leviticus chapter 20. It's towards the front of your Bible. Leviticus 20 and beginning in verse 10. It says this. Now, I want you to think about it as I read this and compare it to the story. Okay? Jesus has this woman that's thrown down in front of him. Look what Leviticus says. If a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. There was no wiggle room here. <laughs> uh, this does not sound like our culture, does it? No. I don't know. Turn over to Deuteronomy. Just keep turning to your right there. Deuteronomy chapter 22. Deuteronomy, the word Deuteronomy means second law. The, the second giving of the law. So this is a reminder to the Israelites, and this is found there again. Deuteronomy 22, verse 22. If a man is found lying with the wife of another man, both of them shall die. The man who lay with the woman and the woman. So what, do, what does this tell us? This tells us that God takes sin very seriously. These two people were caught in sin, and sin is serious. In fact, we know that the, the Bible tells us the wages of sin is what? Is death. In other words, what, what are wages? Wages are something that you get for the work that you've done. Well, he says for the spiritual work of sin, here's your wage. Death. It deserves the death penalty. Sin deserves the death penalty. And this is what was promised to these people. So what they're saying to Jesus is that, Jesus, look, God takes sin very seriously. Here's the problem. They don't. They're playing like they do, but they don't. They could care less, or they couldn't care less about the law here. And look at the problem that's initiated in the story. They only bring the woman. Where is the dude? Where's the guy? If they were caught in the act, that means the man was there as well. You see, the problem here is that she was set up. She's not on trial here. They could care less, of, they could not care less about her. They don't care at all. Jesus is the one that's on the stand here. Using this woman is just ugly and cruel. And their hate, their hate, what they hate is not sin. And their love is not the law. Let, let me just stop for just a second and say, as Christians, we need to be very careful about what we get worked up about. We need to be very cautious, protective in our spiritual life, that we don't find ourselves getting worked up about the law as much as we do about getting worked up about sin, our own sin, 
and especially getting worked up about people being saved. These people hate Jesus. <laughs> we think that the media twists the truth. These guys have got this thing wrapped up in a pretzel. They have so distorted the truth here, and they're trying to trap Jesus with this test. But I want you to see this. Jesus has an answer. So this is, this is my third point already, if you're not tracking with me. Here's the answer to the test. Look in 6, verse 6. This they said to test him, that they might have some charge against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground, and as they continued to ask him, he stood up, and they said to him, uh, they said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground, but when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. I want you to see this. This is so important that you get this out of this story. It is not wrong for them to bring up the law. In fact, Jesus doesn't condemn the law, does he? It doesn't say, the scriptures didn't tell us that Jesus came to eradicate the law, but he came to fulfill the law. Now, the, the word fulfill, it's a very complicated Greek word. Uh, the word fulfill means to um, fill full. It means to fill full. In, in other words, the law, it was meant for a, a good, grand purpose, but it just wasn't complete. What was its purpose? Its purpose is to reveal sin to us, to show us what the standard is, and that we cannot meet the standard ourselves. So what did Jesus do when he came to fulfill the law? He came to show us that he completes the standard. That he is the standard. He is this answer to the test. I want you to see this. The religious leaders are seeking the death penalty, right? Right? I want you to see this. We, we do not have two Gospels. We don't have an Old Testament Gospel and a New Testament Gospel. We don't. We have one complete text that shows us this grand story from Genesis to Revelation. Specifically from Genesis 3.15... All the way to Revelation 22, we have this grand storyline that sin has come upon us. It's caused death. It deserved death. There's no way to make ourselves right with God on our own because you and I are not qualified to make ourselves right on our own. So God, out of his great love and his deep compassion for us, sent to us the only solution, the only answer to the test. Jesus. Jesus. Jesus came to make it right. Jesus came to bring fulfillment, to, to complete the end of the law. The law showed us our sin, and that's great, but that's all it's good for. Was to show us that we can't make it. All right, I'm going to take some time here. Take Romans chapter 3. Turn, turn there in your Bible, Romans chapter 3. Again, I, I want you to see that you can trust this Bible. I, I, I don't know. I preached on this last week about the importance of the Bible, and I'd preach it again, and I'd preach it till I don't have breath left. Why? Because this scripture is the only thing that really gives us the truth. Romans 3 23, all have sinned. Who is all? All. Here in Oklahoma, the, here in Oklahoma, we say all y'all. All y'all. That's a plural all. All y'all. Yeah, you. Yeah, just look at your neighbor. And don't say it out loud, just whisper it. It's you. You are a sinner. You've sinned. All have sinned, and we fall short of the glory of God. We don't reach the standard that God has set for us. We have all sinned and we have all fallen short of the glory of God. Now turn over just a few pages, Romans 6, 23. 
For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now keep turning just, you may not even need to turn. Look at Romans chapter 7, verse 7. What then shall we say, Paul says, that the law is sin? That the law is no good? He says, by no means. Yet, if it had not been for the law, remember, the law is what the Pharisees are bringing to Jesus. They're saying, the law of Moses said this. There's, she got to die. She got caught in the very uh, act. She's got to die. Jesus, are you going to go against the law? The law is right. The law is good. And everybody looks at this passage and goes, well, the law, Jesus didn't care about the law. He just concerned about grace. That's not true. Look at what he says here. By no means is the law sin. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. I wouldn't have known that I was wrong. There used to be a day when in America when everybody knew a little bit of something about the Bible. And they knew that certain things were sinful. And, and listen, I, this is no slam against Billy Graham. I think Billy Graham's the greatest evangelist of all time. Listen, Billy Graham had it easy. He had it easy. You know why? He could preach boo and people would get saved. You know why? Because they already knew that they were sinful. Today, you bring up something like homosexuality or transgenderism or living together. We used to call that fornicating. I don't use that word anymore. Right? Lying, cheat, any, you can name anything. And, but, and people will say, that's not really sin. That's just who I am. No, that's sin. That's rebelling against God. God has a standard. We don't meet the standard. That is called sin. It's transgression against God. You and I don't get to determine what the standard is. So Paul says, no, we don't do away with the law because if I'd not known the law, I wouldn't have known what sin is, what transgressing against God is. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said you shall not covet. Look at verse 8. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law. He means there that he can just do what he wants. But when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life provided death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it it killed me. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin, producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. You say, what in the world, Andy, is Paul saying there? Just this. He's saying, if I had not had the law, I wouldn't have known that I was wrong. But now I have a standard, and I realize I don't meet the standard that God sets, and I can't. I need help. I need somebody who would come and do for me what I cannot do for myself. And that's why, you see, throughout the Old Testament, the law, the law, the law, the law, the law is constantly pointing not to itself. It is pointing to one who is coming. I want you to think about this. The priesthood pointing to one who is coming. The kingship of Israel pointing to one who is coming. The sacrifices pointing to one who is coming. The temple, pointing to one who is coming. The Passover, pointing to one who is coming. The death of a perfect spotless lamb, pointing to the one who is coming that John the Baptist said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You and I need the law to show us that I can't do it, but God has done it. What a great story. So here... If Jesus, I want you to see this. Go back to John chapter 8. If Jesus continues to preach and provide grace to offer forgiveness, then the perception becomes that he's setting aside the holy law of God. Right? However, if he says, okay, boys, everybody grab a rock. She's got to be punished. The number one, Jesus commits treason 
against the Roman government because Jews are not allowed to put anybody to death. And two, and maybe more importantly, what sinner would ever come to Jesus if he had said that? What person would ever come confessing their sin? This is the greatest moral dilemma ever. How can justice and mercy coexist? Can holiness and forgiveness live together? Can grace abound without righteousness being abandoned? And the answer is yes. And the answer is a person. So it says that Jesus bends down and he writes on the ground. So what did he write on the ground? Uh, so much speculation. Uh, he wrote their names. He wrote their sins. The truth is, is that we don't know what he wrote. And the truth is, it doesn't matter. We know that there was silence, at least from him, not from them. Did you see that? While he's writing on the ground, it says they continued to ask him, what are we going to do about this? What are we going to do about the law? What are we going to do about this lawbreaker? What are we going to do about this woman who, is, who has defied Moses? What are we going to do? Then he answers their test and the dilemma. And the reason why he answers the test is because there is no one that is there without sin except one except one friends this is why we say that Jesus is the answer he is your answer he obliterates their plotting he destroys their plan he crushes their hatred all with one single phrase. He doesn't set aside the law. He upholds holiness and he gives grace at the same time because he is a perfectly holy God who is perfectly sinless. And this is a word for us today, church. We must not set aside the word of God. When it comes to morality or the social evils that we oppose... We must not set aside the word of God, but we must act with grace. I want you to hear this very plainly today. Sinners are not the enemy. Can I tell you something? Can I just be real with you all this morning? The Democrats are not the enemy. Some of y'all need help because you didn't name in right there. Listen, Democrats are not the enemy. Whoever's in the White House at the time is not the enemy. Those people out there that are not in church, those people who don't believe, the atheists, the agnostics, whoever else, the Buddhists, everybody else in the world, they are not the enemy. Even, I know this is hard to believe, but people who are not Baptists like you, or Reformed like you, or not Reformed like you, they are not the enemy. Everybody in here is brothers and sisters in Christ. If we are under the blood of Christ. Christ offers forgiveness. But there is a requirement. And when you see this, there is a requirement. And this is, uh, this is my last point for today. You see, the law does not lead us. The law does not provide us forgiveness but it does lead us to grace and I want you to see this in verse 10 it says Jesus stood up and said to her woman where are they has no one condemned you she said no one Lord and Jesus said neither do I condemn you go from from now on and sin no more so one by one they begin to leave everyone leaves even the crowd Jesus was just left alone there with her. Can you imagine this? Can you imagine this poor girl? She's completely all ripped up and tattered and disheveled and everything. She's standing there trembling before the crowd, knowing that she's about to be buried up to her neck and her brain's beaten out with rocks. She knows that she's guilty. She knows 
She knows that Jesus knows that she's guilty. And so the question today is, do you know? Do you know that you stand guilty before God as a sinner, as a transgressor, that you've broken God's law? If you've lied before, you've broken God's law. If you've, you commit whatever sin, you, you just need to understand that we are, we are breakers of law. You know what we call breakers of law in our culture? Criminals. We are criminal against God. And the question today is, do you know it? Has the standard of God in his word convinced you? Has it convicted you? Has it burdened your heart? And you know that you're guilty. It just weighs on you. It must have been so heavy on this girl. So desperately um, heavy upon her. But look what Jesus does. This is so incredible. Jesus stood up and said, where are they? Does no one condemn you? See, he knew and she knew that she was guilty. Jesus doesn't condemn her. And the reason why is she's already condemned. She's already condemned. Turn, turn back just, this is the last time I'll have you turn. John chapter 3. I hope, maybe James told me the truth. He told me y'all don't get out till noon, so I'm just going to keep preaching till noon, right? I don't know. Everybody knows John 3, 16, right? Yeah? For God so loved the world, John chapter 3, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world. Look at this. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him, whoever believes in him is not condemned... But whoever does not believe is condemned already. You see, for those who have never trusted in Christ in the finished work of the cross, the fact that Jesus died on the cross for our death penalty for breaking the law of Moses, Jesus took our death penalty, the, what, what should have been a tag to our account, Jesus took it and he died for it. He died in your place as a substitute. A sacrifice for you. And he did it for this woman already. She knew that she was condemned. But Jesus comes to save. Isn't that good news today? It's good news for this woman. Only Jesus can perfectly harmonize God's justice against sin and grace and forgiveness. Sin deserves death. And Christ would be the only one to die that death. Because he's the only one that's qualified. None of us deserves grace. If we all got what we deserved, if all of us in here, every single one of us, got what we deserved, it would not be pretty. But praise be to God, Christ gives his mercy. You all probably know that song. His mercy is more. Oh, So this story rings true, does it not? I know there's that little parenthetical reference there, and now you know why it's there. And I hope you don't ever question it again. The story rings true because it teaches the point of the entire Bible. That you cannot make yourself right with God. You are a sinner who needs grace. But the good news is that Jesus freely gives you grace if you will only come to him. The Bible also does not teach that God loves you just the way you are. He loves you, yes, but he does not want to leave you just the way you are. He wants to change you, to transform you, to make you look less like sinful you and more like Jesus, the Savior. He commands the woman to stop it. Do you see that? Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go. Go live your life. 
But from now on, sin no more. He means don't continue to live in this. It doesn't mean you'll be condemned if you stumble, if you mess up again. By the way, you will. And Jesus knows you will. But he says, leave it again. Turn and run again and again and again. You must repent and believe. You must recognize that you're a guilty sinner, that you're fallen, that you're depraved, that you're wicked. That we're an enemy of God, not, not compared to others, not compared to the, next, to the person next to you, but compared to God's standards. So the Bible says that we are to repent, like Jesus tells this woman, to go and sin no more. We need to stop, turn, flee, run, avoid, again and again and again. The truth is, it is a lifetime of repentance. Hello. Is that true? Yeah, those of you who've been walking this road for a long time, you know, it, yeah, it's frustrating. Why did I do that again? I love where Paul says that in Romans chapter 7. He says, why do I do the very thing I don't want to do? And the very thing I don't want to do, I do it. Why is that? Well, Paul, because you're just like us, knuckleheads. Just like us. That's what we do. But thank God, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, right? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So today, I, I beg of you to do this. First of all, is to trust the Bible. Trust the word that you have in your hands. And what this whole Bible that you can trust tells you is that you need grace. That you can't, you can't complete God's standard on your own. That's what this story tells us. The woman couldn't do it. The Pharisees didn't care about it. But Jesus gave it again and again. Grace. So I don't know what you've done. I don't know what's happened in your life. I, I know that you're like me, sinful, full of sin. But while I am full of sin, Jesus came to fill full the law and complete it and give us grace. His grace is sufficient for you. So today, look to Jesus who died your death in order to give you life. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes for just a few moments. I, I hope today that uh, this kind of uh, this lesson, this sermon, will help you to understand that the totality of the Bible from beginning to end shows us this great grand truth that on your own, you can't do enough, you can't make yourself better, you can't be a little bit more moral, it's not sufficient. It won't stand up to the standard that God has set. But the good news is that God sent his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross for the death you deserved. And the Bible says that if you trust Christ if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, it says you'll be saved. And now God the Father, as he looks at you and your account of sin, what he sees is the Son. He sees the perfection of his Son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus' perfection is applied to your account if you would trust him. Not trust the church, not trust morality, but Jesus. Some of you need to come and trust Jesus today. Some of you need to come and confess your sin. Some of you may need to come just like this woman did, like all of us have at some point. We come and we crumple before the cross and say, God, I'm helpless. I need your help. Forgive me and make me new. If you need to do that today, a couple of your staff members are going to be here at the front. We'll have an opportunity, have an invitation. Maybe you need to come and pray with them. Or maybe there's something else that you need to come and pray about. Maybe there's a sin that you need to repent of. There's something that you're struggling with that you need God's forgiveness. As, as God says, go and sin no more. Maybe you just need to come and say, God, I'm leaving it right here. I'm, I'm dropping it here. And the good news is that Jesus says, who condemns you? Neither do I. Come and be right with God today. Come and... And, and confess your sin to the Lord 
and stand before a holy God knowing that you've been made clean by a perfect Savior. Father, thank you for your word. Help us to trust you today. Do what only you can do in these moments. Help us to see our sin through the law and help us to rely on the grace that you give us in Jesus. Our high priest, our king, our savior. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together for just a few moments. If you do need to come as we begin to sing this song, you've got a couple of staff members who are going to come here. They'll be willing to pray with you this morning. We invite you to come this morning as we begin to sing.